who wants to start? Hello, everybody. We're back. We have, I mean, a pretty exciting update, I think. And Sarah is, I'm jealous. You're at the state house. I'm home. I got a sick kid. She's not too bad, but here we are. Um, I'm still back in the Zoom window. Ah. We almost had an in-person uh, video update this week. So close. Maybe next time. I hope so. Yeah. So lots going on. Budget is on the House floor later this week. We've passed crossover. So we got to update people. Why don't you go first? Because the House has been doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Yeah, we've got um, a series of bills. We talked about these at our uh, Climate Caucus meeting last week. Um, some some really great policy bills and then a, a whole slew of spending that's contained in uh, the, the budget bill and in the transportation bill that are up for action this afternoon in the House. Um, our um, Natural Resources Committee has done a lot of really good work on climate related bills, um, a, a bill uh, specifically allowing old growth forests to qualify for current use. So you're not required to cut those old forests down um, in order to be able to, to enroll that land in current use, uh, really a benefit to um, making sure that we maintain the mature forests that we have because they're better carbon sinks. Uh, we've got an Act 250 governance um, reform bill that it's making its way through. Uh, Act 250 is an important land use um, uh, program for the state of Vermont and uh, the governance of that really need needed a little bit of updating. Um, so that's an exciting climate related bill. 30 by 30. Let me, let me is, just jump, jump in yeah. and tell you there's also Act 250 tweaks moving in the Senate that promote downtown housing development. That's an anti-sprawl measure um, and also I think make tweaks to the triggers of when Act 250 is involved outside of downtowns so that we're better protecting those special parcels of nature of, of ecosystems delicate ecosystems etc so so actually the, both chambers moving moving related bills there which is encouraging sorry Excellent. i cut you off back to you yep. No worries. Um, feel free to jump in if you want to add anything. Um, the 30 by 30 bill is really um, setting in motion a, a goal to get to 30 percent conserved land and water, um, which we uh, know from our work on climate and from the Climate Council's work that is in, going to be important um, going forward. Um, we've got a bill on HFCs uh, that that is also a, a really important bill out of the um, out of the Natural Resources Committee. And uh, and then, of course, one of our premier bills um, being the Clean Heat Standard, which uh, came out of the House last week, is over to you all in the Senate at this point. And, um, and that's really a, a landmark um, development that uh, allows us to regulate for the first time uh, fossil fuels and fossil fuel use in, in the heating realm. Um, really revolutionary. Yeah, yeah, jump in. No, really exciting to see that progress. We've talked about it on these updates before. And, you know, there are critiques of it that are legitimate. We have to figure out how exactly we or if we want to use biofuels and others, uh, other kinds of very fair questions. But um, we are taking this huge leap that I, I frankly was never, oh, I'm still not quite sure we'll ever, we'll get to, which is regulating uh, home home heat and fossil fuel dealers, um, unregulated fuels by and large. So, so uh, really, really promising a significant step forward and mirroring uh, what only a few states I think are doing. So, so really putting us at the, the leading edge here in Vermont. And of course, our thermal uh, um, emissions from buildings is the second leading leading cause of emission. So I, I'm very excited for the Senate to get to work on that and build on the good work that the, the House has done, a pretty important threshold question of, of how we're going to engage the home heat industry. Um, yes, absolutely. A um, lot of lot of potential there. We've talked about it previously on these uh, video updates, and we will certainly come back to it again before the end of the session. Um, the only other bill that I wanted to point out that's originating on the House side is that municipal fuel switching bill. So this is a this is a bill that mirrors the the state's energy management program and and allows for municipalities to access uh, funds and support uh, technical support in how to do energy assessments of municipal buildings, so that our municipalities 
utilities can be poised when it's time to replace the heating system that uh, you know that heats your town offices. Uh, that that we have done the weatherization and we are ready to move forward into a renewable energy um, heating system for our municipal buildings. Uh, you know, many of our towns, um, our municipal buildings are are among the oldest buildings in town, um, and we need to uh, we need to cherish them and we need to update them in a way that will make them sustainable going forward. It's so it's a win 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 because it's going to reduce pollution out of those buildings, uh, but it's also going to save uh, taxpayers um, money in terms of supporting those buildings. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I'm really excited about this bill as well. Yeah, me too. And, and you know, the, the weatherization as, as a simple way of looking at building efficiencies is always cost effective. I mean, extremely so in, in that you quickly get a payback and then you're you're saving money every year. But just like it is a challenge for homes, it's a challenge for the public to to support it through their town budgets. And and so this is this is the state sort of helping to front the cost. Um, and and I'm excited to to see those steps. Um, should I jump quickly to the Senate and then then we want to talk about the budget, which is really you know, it's easy to talk about lots of bills and then do short change to the $140 million of, of spending that's outlined in the House budget. But um, yeah. but uh, the, the policy changes are important, too. Um, we're seeing the Senate uh, this week debate the environmental justice bill, sometimes called the Just Transition Bill, that sets up a structure um, so that as we embark on these investments and this work as a state and as a community, we're sensitized and, and paying close attention to everybody involved and, and trying our, our hardest to correct historic um, injustices, whether, uh, you know, that just so happens that trailer parks are in flood zones, for instance, uh, you know, our, our uh, black and brown neighbors are, are too often, um, you know, not benefited from climate investments. And in fact, seeing the, the downside of pollution are, are kind of, uh, neighborhood targets of pollution. You see that all over the world. We want to we want to make those take those steps, and and this is a robust uh, way to begin that process. We've also I, I mentioned the Act 250 change. We also saw a weatherization bill move. This um, is a there's there's money traveling in the budget, uh, but the weatherization bill, in addition to deciding how the money spent has a, a key look at workforce. Um, you know, all the money that we can free up from the state to pay for weatherization doesn't do us much good if we don't have the people to do the work. And that's a struggle for businesses of all kinds right now. <clears throat> so there, there's some uh, money to go to Vermont Technical College, Vermont and, and other institutions that can help train people. So I, I'm, I'm excited by, by those couple of steps um, and, and I'm sure there are more that I'm forgetting, but, um, so that, that's, that's a couple of bills originating out of, originating out of the Senate in addition to that act 250 change. Um, and then I guess we might as well get to the main event here, the, the house budget, which is the house always starts this project. Um, the Senate will respond and, and hopefully, um, do some good stuff in there is the transportation budget to bait is part of the big budget. So, um, if you've been wondering why we haven't talked about transportation, our number one emitter, that's why. Um, so do you want to take a crack, Sarah? And we can yeah. kind of split up some of the good yeah. news. Let me uh, let me frame it up here just sort of in a general sense. Um, we're looking at a budget proposal that puts forward uh, $131 million in climate investments uh, from the ARPA dollars. Um, so that's the federal money that uh, that has come to to help stimulate uh, states um, in in the wake of the the COVID pandemic, and another forty million in uh, in general fund spending. Which you know, Chris, you and I have been at this for a while. Um, this is a tremendous investment, and in, and you know, we used to scrape and scrounge for for five or ten million dollars total, yeah. and now we're looking yeah. at uh, and not some get investment. it and not get, and not it, get right? it right. Yeah, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We could ask for a modest amount and fail, but at this moment in time, um, you know, we're really seeing. Uh, we're seeing because of the climate plan that the Climate Council put forward, uh, really giving us some momentum to ask for some real dollars. And those dollars fall, you know, into two sort of 
big categories with a lot of details inside. One one of those categories being the weatherization that Chris was talking about, and the other uh, category roughly being um, the transportation spending, which includes investment in uh, in public EV charging infrastructure, it includes investment in um, EV charging in infrastructure near multifamily housing units. It includes electric upgrades for, uh, for, for low income people in their homes in order to allow them to be able to, to install the, the electric charging infrastructure or electrification of their heating system that they may need to in the future. Um, and then, of course, it, it, it has EV incentives um, for the purchase of EVs, um, the mileage smart program and, and replace your ride, uh, as well as a little bit on e-bikes and e-snowmobiles, which sounds like a great um, a great idea, uh, especially when you think about how noisy those snowmobiles are. You don't have snowmobiles, Chris, that go b buzzing by your house in yeah, the wintertime, but, yeah. but I do. And I think uh, an electric snowmobile would um, be less likely to wake me up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Yeah, I think the governor was uh, was seen riding one at some kind of event. And, you know, obviously a race car driver is into, into these kinds of things. And he was raving about them. He said, oh, wow, they're quiet, they're fast. And uh, they're made just north of the border in Quebec and, and actually quite affordable. So, you know, it's an interesting thing. I mean, maybe not the top priority, but we need that. This is, to me, part of the cultural shift, too, of, of saying, hey, you know, we're not talking about replacing your car with a go-kart here. We're talking about some pretty exciting technology that that uh, if we can get more people in, and, and of course with gasoline being over $4 a gallon, people are kind of ready. Hey, is there some, you're telling me I can plug my car in and have it charged at home and effectively like dollar, dollar fifty uh, equivalent to gas at a dollar fifty. Um, a gallon. I mean, there's a lot to like here. And, and uh, so great to see those investments. Um, uh, you know, some of them is also direct, direct incentives for people, tax breaks for people buying electric cars, uh, EV charging stations, as you've said, and, and on and on. And then uh, $45, $45 million for uh, what we think of as the low income weatherization program, 45, you know, few years ago, we were thrilled to get that up to 17 million. So now we're at 45 million and then 35 million on top of that for moderate home, uh, moderate income homes so that we can, you know, expand it. It, it. This is not just a low income program and nor should it be. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Along the way, there's $25 million for electric upgrades because, you know, when you go to, as we did it in my house, we had to remove knob and tube wiring in order to do the weatherization work and that costs money and and particularly if you're in low and uh, middle income households that's another barrier so some investments recognizing that reality on the ground um, and then there's some flood mitigation money there's some uh, money through to to go to uh, uh, agronomic practices so making our farm sector more um, more sustainable. Uh, there's there's more money for parks and forestry. Uh, there's money for getting local food into the food banks. Again, more of a sustainable shift. Um, so so boy, I, I mean, I can't remember being quite as upbeat about a budget um, that that's coming down. And last year, last year we were we were excited there was more money going to weatherization than before but there was basically with these with the federal dollars there was like a fence around it we're going to spend a lot on climate and and that in itself was a victory and brought about because of grassroots pressure and 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 leadership but now we're starting to see well really what could those details look like and and the bottom line is this could begin the transformation, right? Really, really begin the transformation to our electric grid, to our homes, to our transportation infrastructure. Um, and, and look back, you know, if we nail this, if we do a good job in the next 10, 15 years, I think it's fair to say folks will look to the 2022 budget, 2023 budget is, is what we're passing now and say that's when they really got serious. And, and uh, it's all because of you, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks for your work. <laughs> Happy to help. You know, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, but in all seriousness, uh, you know, this has been uh, this has been a, a years long effort on the part of those of us in the legislature who are passionate about climate in trying to help Vermonters understand what we're doing and why and, and how it really is going to benefit. Benefit. Um, our communities, uh, both in terms of climate, but also in terms of uh, the economic benefits. Um, and so, you know, we have to send a big shout out of thank you to all of the folks who are contacting their legislators and urging them to support these uh, these important bills, because, um, you know, we can't get these through the legislative process unless elected officials know that their constituents are supporting this. So if you're watching, please thank your um, your Senate uh, Senator or your representative for supporting uh, this climate package. Yeah, the climate package. And, and you know, the, the I'm also intrigued by years ago, you and I went around the state and talked about particularly the Global Warming Solutions Act as a foundation, as a structure that will lead. And that was a lot to ask of voters and, and grassroots activists to say, no, trust us, this is an important first step and it will lead here. But we're seeing that. And, and you know, I'm reminded the New Deal that transformed the U.S. economy under FDR way back when was not one bill, right? It was a process over 10 years that that really did support, uh, you know, do a, a tremendous amount to end poverty, particularly for seniors and, you know, all manner of things like the 40 hour work week and and just norms now in our our economy. And and I, I feel like we're mirroring that a little bit and, and we're starting to see the payoff. So. Um, for everybody watching, um, do please reach out to legislators. Say it's important to, to me that you support the climate package and uh, keep the pressure up because there's more we could be doing. I'm sure there's uh, you know more more priorities that we we won't have reached even in this 170 million dollar package. Um, and uh, oh. I will say too, a little thing, the di divesting our pension funds. This has been a, an activist call all around the country. New York State now is moving to divest. The Rockefeller Foundation, Green Mountain Power, all sorts of people have made this choice since we started this conversation in Montpelier going back about 10 years. And um, we're still running into resistance for the Vermont Pension Board, but we, we do have a uh, 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 we're asking them for an analysis, a fresh analysis, particularly given the New York State is doing this, uh, our neighbor right next door. It's a little hard to argue that this is unrealistic as other states are making this step. Maine did it. Um, so that is also traveling um, and moving and, and won't have a bill number, but will be part of the budget as I understand it. So another, another important thing, uh, particularly for some grassroots partners. So anything else to add other than thanks for Bob, Sarah? Thank you to Bob for uh, for helping us out with these video updates and um, and for helping us to get this word out because we really can't do this without communicating with all of the voters around the state who are passionate about climate. And uh, thank you, Chris, for being a good partner in this. And um, you know, I look forward to to push, pull, and drag these uh, important bills across the line this legislative session. So, you know, between now and mid mid May, we've got a lot of um, a lot of pieces to keep track of and a lot of um, policy to move forward with. And uh, so thanks for all of you sticking around and, and helping us do this work um, and uh, and supporting your legislators in supporting this climate agenda. Thank you, Sarah. Be well.